Hi guys. So this is a small podcast on fever, something which is very essential and uh, something very basic to the ICU. So I'll discuss it under four headings. One, should we treat all fever? Second, when do we say the patient has fever in the ICU? So all patients, you know, having some degree of elevation can be called to have fever. Third, something about etiology and pathogenesis. And fourth, treatment of uh, fever and shivering. So first of all, if the patient has 101 degree Fahrenheit temperature, we give paracetamol. Is it justified or is it correct? Now, uh, the IDSA, that is the Infectious Disease Society of America, and the SCCM, the Society of Critical Care Medicine America, in a joint statement published last year, say that uh, fever is actually to be treated only if it's more than 103 degree Fahrenheit. And uh, that is because fever is supposed to have beneficial effects. Why it has beneficial effects? Because it inhibits the pathogen growth, it uh, boosts the immune system. And studies have shown that if you treat fever or do not treat fever, the outcome is the same. So that is the rationale. However, we know if the patient is conscious and develops this amount of fever, he gets very uncomfortable. So we have to give paracetamol. However, if the patient is under sedation, then some degree of elevation of fever may not be treated because you do not want to over-medicate. You give paracetamol and paracetamol has side effects, right? Paracetamol can lead to hypotension. Paracetamol leads to a drop in blood pressure because it inhibits the formation of prostaglandins which cause vasoconstriction. If the patient has significant liver disease, it can cause further damage to the liver. Uh, how much paracetamol can you give to a patient of liver disease, either CLD or ALF? So you can give around two grams, maximum is two grams. You can give some paracetamol. So that was about uh, treating fever when and, you know the patient is having 103 degrees Fahrenheit fever and whether he is uh, on sedation or without sedation. Now, the other aspect is what does fever do? It increases the metabolism. It increases the oxygen requirement and the fluid uh, requirement by 10% for every one degree rise in uh, fever centigrade. So these patients who are, you know, having limited cardiorespiratory reserve have to be treated for fever because it will lead to instability. Now, the third group is the neurocritical group because if you don't treat fever here, it leads to neuronal injury. So it is very clear neurocritical care patients have to be treated. Now, the other group is the therapeutic hypothermia. So as per the current guidelines, what do we do? Should we do therapeutic hypothermia? So it is very clear that fever should not occur in these patients and fever is defined as 100 degree core temperature. I'll come to core and surface temperature. So the fever should not go more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit in these therapeutic hypothermia for 72 hours after instituting uh, your treatment for hypoxic encephalopathy. And therapeutic hypothermia is advocated loosely. There are no strict guidelines. It has not been shown to be harmful, neither beneficial. So it's best to do some degree of therapeutic hypothermia. So that was about uh, treating uh, fever. At the end of the day, one must realize that one should not give paracetamol at the drop of a hat. If the patient is comfortable, 100, 100 degree Fahrenheit, there's no need to give paracetamol. But if he is unstable, cardiorespiratory reserve is poor, or if he is a neurocritical care patient, then you should give paracetamol. Now, second point is, when do you say the patient has fever? Supposing the patient has 100 degrees Fahrenheit a couple of times or continuous 99.5, does he have fever? So the definition of fever is that either he has a oral temperature of more than 100 degree Fahrenheit or if he has more than 101 degree core temperature. So core temperature and surface temperature are different. Surface temperature is either oral or axillary or even by tympanometer when you put a tympanometer in the eardrum. So that is the surface temperature. Surface temperature is always less than the core temperature. Core temperature is measured. The gold standard is uh, pulmonary artery catheter. The other ways are you can put an esophageal probe or you can put a urinary bladder thermistor. 
but these are very cumbersome and not feasible, as you understand. So what is the best way to check the core temperature? The best way is to put a nasopharyngeal probe. One end is attached to the monitor, the other end goes into the nasopharynx from the nostrils. So you push in 10 to 15 centimeter from the nostril and it goes and sits in the nasopharynx. The position has to be kind of accurate and there it lies over the internal carotid artery. So that gives you the core temperature. Now, uh, moving on to the rectal temperature, that is not to be done. It has many problems. Don't check the rectal temperature. Now, moving on to uh, causes and pathogenesis. So how is fever generated? As far as generation of fever is concerned, there is a pre-optic area in the hypothalamus. And there's a thermostat here. The thermostat is set at 98.6 degree Fahrenheit with a diurnal variation of 1 degree Fahrenheit. The evening temperature is more than the morning temperature. However, this may be lost in the ICU because the diurnal variation is lost in the ICU. So what happens in fever? Fever is classically caused by infections, inflammations, etc. But please remember 50% of the fever occurring in the ICU is non-infectious. That is very important. Should always look for non-infectious causes before you say that it is an infection and start the antibiotics. So when there is an infection or sepsis or inflammation, cytokines are released. Now these cytokines go and hit the brain and they lead to formation of prostaglandins. Now the prostaglandins are secreted in the brain and they go and lead to secretion of CAMP by microglia. And these microglia are projecting into the hypothalamus and this CAMP, CAMP acts as a neurotransmitter. And it excites the neurons in the preoptic area, which leads to elevation of the thermostat and that leads to fever. Signals are sent from the hypothalamus down the entire body and there's an elevation. And that is why you also get shivering because shivering is a means of elevating the body temperature because when you shiver, Muscles contract and heat is generated. Now, the other kind of fever that you get is hyperthermia. So there is a difference in hyperthermia and the fever that you get from infections or inflammations. Hyperthermia is due to loss of heat dissipating mechanisms because normally also, you know, in the body, heat is being generated all the time and this heat is dissipated to the environment. So when the ambient temperature becomes very high, this heat dissipating mechanism fails and that is why you get heat stroke and the other reason is there is internal thermogenesis there is a lot of heat production in the body and that happens in conditions like malignant hyperthermia thyrotoxicosis neuroleptic malignant syndrome and so on and so forth so there there is excessive heat production and this cannot be dissipated so the person develops fever this is called hyperthermia and if the temperature is more than 106 degrees, it is 99% likely to be because of hypothermia and not an infection or inflammatory process because there is a ceiling to the temperature that can be set by hypothermia or, hypothal or uh, infections because there is a natural mechanism to counter this. Now, uh, moving on to neurocritical patients. Why do neurocritical patients get fever? So neurocritical care patients get fever because there is local production of cytokines and these migrate and you know go to the hypothalamus and again stimulate the preoptic area. Sometimes the hypothalamus may be involved directly. So that was about the etiopathogenesis of fever and shivering. Now coming to the treatment. So you all know treatment of fever, the basics, but one should be very specific about this and especially shivering. So first of all, what drugs do we have for treating fever. For treating fever, we have paracetamol. So maximum dose is one gram six hourly. As I told you, it can cause hypotension and one has to be cautious in liver disease. The second drug is NSAIDs. You can give orally. If you cannot give orally, then you can give IV. IV diclofenac, 75 milligram over four hour infusion or IV brufen if it is available in the, your country. Then apart from that, you can give steroids also. Steroids work very well for fever. If there's no contraindication, 100 milligram hourly hydrocortisone can be given. And these work by blocking the mRNA transcription to cytokines. And they act centrally also and inhibit the 
production of prostaglandins in the brain. Now, apart from this, you have uh, sponging. You can do tepid sponging. You can put the fan because this leads to surface cooling. And if there is extreme elevation of temperature, then you need to institute surface cooling. So surface cooling can be done by putting ice packs on the body or by using cooling blankets. However, when you use this, there's a drastic drop in temperature and the patient may start shivering. And shivering is again very common when you induce ther therapeutic hypothermia. And shivering is not good because it will lead to elevation of body temperature again. And very importantly, there's a 30% increase in oxygen consumption when the patient starts to shiver, which is detrimental in those patients who have limited cardiorespiratory reserve. So what is to be done here for shivering? What is the treatment for shivering? A patient shiver otherwise also, when they have new onset fever touching 103, they have uh, chills and rigors and it can be very uncomfortable and it's very visible. So the drug of choice for shivering is pethidine and uh, it is also known as meperidine. Dose is 70, 25 to 50 milligram IV and you can also give other drugs. So magnesium can be given, magnesium sulfate, four grams over 15 minutes. And the other drugs are sedations like uh, propofol in low doses or fentanyl, or you can use dexmetromidine. They all act centrally and uh, suppress the shivering center. And uh, magnesium acts centrally. It also causes vasodilatation. It also causes peripheral vasodilatation leading to heat loss. So these are some of the drugs that you can use. Apart from this, uh, what about the role for uh, uh, cold bolus? Should we give a cold bolus? So in therapeutic hypothermia, cold bolus should not be given because after cardiac arrest, EF is low. So if you give a cold bolus, then pulmonary edema will occur and even arrhythmias can occur. But uh, in other situations, 500 ml at 4 degrees centigrade over uh, an hour or two hours can be given not more than that because arrhythmias can occur and you know the complications can occur. So that was uh, about fever in just 10-15 uh, minutes and if you have any comments, questions, please put them up in the chat box and uh, I will post a question for everybody just to you know stimulate the neurons, food for thought, try to answer that, it'll help in engaging in discussion and you know activate our neurons. So see you again, guys. Thank you for supporting our channel. Take care. Good night.